the words of Jesus from John 16, to his closest followers. In this world, you will have trouble. Look, I know Jesus said it, but we still try to avoid it. I mean, it's just human nature. You try to still steer clear of the troubles in this life, but lately it just seems like there's nowhere to go. Every path forward seems to be a troubled path. And so here's what I want to do for the next few minutes is I just want to take you back to the upper room on the night Jesus would be arrested and crucified. So I want to take you back to the upper room in John 14. Jesus knew what was coming that evening. He knew he was going to be betrayed with a kiss, arrested and beaten and sentenced to death. He knew it, but the rest of them didn't. And so he's down to his final words with his closest followers and John records them for us. In chapters 14 through 16, um, this is a section of scripture that's often referred to as the final discourse. These are the final words of Jesus to his closest followers. And in this talk, Jesus wants to prepare them for what's coming because the future is not going to at all go the way they think it's going to go. It's not going to be what they were expecting. They were used to having Jesus with them. Like all the time, they were used to having him there to calm the storm or put the religious leaders in place or to win over the people, you know, with his teaching and miracles. But he was going to be leaving them at least for a little while. And he wants his followers to be ready for the trouble that's coming. So that's the word he uses, trouble. And we see this word used throughout the final discourse where Jesus again and again warns them of what's coming. And so it begins... The discourse begins with Jesus saying in chapter 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. And it ends in chapter 16 with Jesus saying, in this world, you will have much trouble. And the word trouble is a severe word. There's other words that could be used for annoyances or or frustrations, but that's not this. Like this is a word reserved uh, for deep pain, for intense struggle, for overwhelming discouragement. And so Jesus begins and ends his talk by making sure they understand that that trouble's coming. You need to be ready for it. And so what Jesus does in that final discourse is he tells them that there's gonna be trouble, but then he says, don't be troubled by trouble. He speaks to the hearts of these leaders, these world changers, and he says, look, yeah, yeah, there will be trouble, but don't let trouble trouble you. Okay, so... Um, that's it then? I mean, do you have a podcast I could listen to? Uh, it, trouble is coming, but don't let trouble trouble me. I mean, that, that's, that's it. Jesus says, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. And I guess I just expect him to give some kind of reason that um, is more informative. Like he, maybe he would say, I don't know, don't, Let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to fix your problems. I'm going to change your circumstances. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't say, don't don't let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to make sure everything is really comfortable, comfortable and convenient for you. Instead, here's what he says. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So the word believe here, also translated trust, is the idea of putting all your weight onto something. Now, I know that, you know, for most of us, when I say belief, it's, um, it's just kind of an easy word to dismiss. It's a word we use a lot. So let me give you an image to help you with this. Uh, the image I would use is um, of a walker. You know what I mean by walker? The, you might see somebody elderly using a walker where they, they put their weight on it and then they take a step forward and they put their weight on it. So they, they take a step forward, put their weight on, that's Walker. And it's a pretty decent image to be, for the word belief because belief is, belief is what you put your weight on so that you can move forward. That's belief. What do you put your weight on so you can move forward? Whatever you put your weight on, that's what you believe in. And in this season, one of the things we've been reminded of is that if you put your weight on anything or anyone other than Jesus, you discover that it, it, it doesn't hold up. And I think there's a lot of frustration in our world right now. There's a lot of anger and division because what people are trying to put their weight on isn't working. And we, we wanna move forward, 
but we put all of our weight on, on a political system. We put our weight on social structures or even on the constitution and it just can't seem to handle the weight of everything happening in our world. And so people become angry and discouraged and disillusioned because it, it, it feels like we're putting our weight on something that promises to hold us up and allow us to move forward, but it doesn't. And we get stuck or we fall on our face. And so the question that we're wrestling with is, do I really, do I really believe in Jesus? You know, in seasons like this where we're facing cultural tensions and, and health threats, this is the time for us to double down on Jesus for us to declare our go-to is the gospel, our creed is the cross. To tell people who wanna be a part of a movement to change the world, we've got a movement for you and our movement is his mission. In this season of trouble, you know, that sometimes feels a little bit more like tribulation, we're gonna put all of our weight on Jesus. That's what it means to believe in him. And so as Jesus talks to his disciples about the way forward, those are the two words that jump out in this final discourse. The two words are trouble and belief. In fact, in the first half of John 14, Jesus tells his followers to believe a half a dozen times. And when he tells them to believe, it's a command. Like he, he doesn't say, hey, here's a best practice for you. He doesn't say, here's a helpful hint. He says to believe, it's a command. And, and I know it, it seems a little bit simplistic, this message um, to a bunch of church leaders. But look, I mean, Jesus decided that this was the message his disciples needed to hear. I mean, again and again, he had taught them with parables and different lessons and messages. And, but when it came down to it, this is the one that he circled. He commands them to believe. Why? Because belief in your heart is what allows you to keep moving forward. Belief is what keeps trouble from troubling you. But it's a command. It, to not believe is a sin, it's the sin of unbelief. Unbelief is what makes trouble especially troubling. And so genuine and wholehearted belief in Jesus is what keeps us moving forward. Uh, there's a picture of what this looks like in Exodus 14. You know the story. Moses is leading the people to the promised land. You got Pharaoh and his army chasing after them. And Moses finds himself in a position as a leader where there doesn't seem to be any right way to go. Like the, the Red Sea is right there and the Egyptian army is closing in quick. It's, um, it's what you might call a troubling situation. And so I want you to see what the people do in this moment, because in the middle of all the trouble, here, here's what the people do. I don't know if this will sound familiar to you at all. The people respond to the trouble by complaining, criticizing, by being negative and divisive. I don't know if you know any people like that any groups of people that can sometimes be that way when things are difficult, but that's what the people do. So let's look at this, Exodus 14. It says that the people said to Moses, their leader, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? So they're sarcastic and they're pointing the finger and blaming Moses for the situation that they're in. They go on to say to Moses, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. And then they say it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So they're just hypercritical and complaining and being negative and divisive. This is what people do in times of trouble. This is what people who don't believe do. Trouble comes. And you start to see the unbelief surface in anxiety and anger and people lashing out and lots of frustration and lots of divisiveness, lots of criticism and complaining. Now here's what Moses does. And I think it's a beautiful example for anybody who's in leadership. When he replies to the people who are complaining and being critical and negative, what he doesn't do is go through their list of complaints, right? Like he doesn't say, well, you know, let's talk about this. You know, in Egypt, I, uh, I rem remember you saying that you wanted to leave. I don't remember you saying you wanted to stay there and serve. Now, he, he doesn't like get into some email war with them. He doesn't try to debate them on social media. And instead, and instead of choosing some kind of side, he seems to recognize that their, their negativity and their criticism and their complaining is coming, it's coming from a place of unbelief. So what do you do then as a leader? 
Well, he doesn't get offended. And he doesn't have time to be offended. He can't afford to take things personally. There's way too much at stake to do that. Instead, he sees that it's coming from fear and unbelief and he speaks faith and belief into their hearts. So Exodus 14, we read, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. He goes on to say, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I wonder how he said that. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I don't think he said it like a, like a counseling session where he's like, hey, 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 be still. The Lord's gonna fight for you. I don't think it was like that. I think it was more of a halftime talk. Be still, the Lord will fight for you. I mean, I know right now, and certainly in months to come, we live in a world where there's a lot of, a lot of trouble, a lot of opinions and criticisms, a lot of negativity. So how do you lead through that? By speaking faith and belief into the hearts of people. This is not the time to lead from a victim mentality. We're not victims. The God who created the world is on our side. So stop acting like we're the underdog in all this. The church will never be the underdog. The God who spoke the world into existence is the God we believe in. So why are we acting like we're defeated and discouraged when we know the plan? When we know that the victory has already been won? Be still, the Lord will fight for you. And in this season where so many of us as pastors, church leaders, I mean, we've been in a panic, running around, everybody's yelling, pivot, pivot, just be still. I've quoted this verse uh, many, many times as a pastor. Be still, let the Lord fight for you. When I'm with someone in the middle of a, a troubling season, I'll speak that verse, be still, let the Lord fight for you. You feel like your marriage has fallen apart and you've tried and tried to fix it. And now you're, you're panicky. Be still, you're just making things worse. Let God do what God does. Be still, let God fight for you. And you're not sure where the next mortgage payment is coming from. And the stress and the anxiety is not only um, overwhelming you, but it's overwhelming your, your family and your children. And the tension's just infecting your home. Be still, let the Lord fight for you. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed because of the uncertainty of this season. Just be still, be still. And so I've declared this plenty of times over plenty of people, but I gotta confess to you something. I've never really paid that much attention to the next verse. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe you have, but verse 14 says, be still, let the Lord fight for you. But then verse 15, we read, then the Lord said to Moses, why, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to keep moving. <laughs> Did you see what happens? Moses says to the people, be still. God says, keep moving. Moses says, be still, let the Lord fight for you. God says, why are we talking about this? Keep, keep moving, why aren't you moving? Well, there's a Red Sea right like right here, it's right here. Keep moving, keep moving forward. And look, this is what belief does for us. Belief allows us to be still without stopping. Belief allows us to be still in our spirit while we continue to move forward with our feet. And I don't know about you, but that is a message that I need in this season of life. Like it's not just um, be still or move forward. It's be still and move forward. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I'm gonna keep moving forward with the stillness in my spirit that comes from knowing that God will fight for me. I'm gonna keep moving forward with the calm confidence that the battle belongs to the Lord. And that's what happens in Exodus 14. The people move forward. God splits the Red Sea. The people walk through it. And what Moses does for the people is my commitment as a pastor in this season to say to our church, look, we're, we're not gonna freak out. We're not gonna do it. We're not gonna be the freak out people. We're, we're not gonna 
act like we don't have confidence when we have confidence. We're not going to act like we don't have hope when we have the hope of the world. We're not going to act like we don't have power when the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead is available to us today. Everyone else is troubled by trouble. We're not because we, we know that the Lord is the one who fights for us. So look, I know there's trouble. I'm not troubled. I know things are uncertain, but I am certain. John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world.